Hello, I'm Michael Mann for Bennett's Bike Social and welcome to the latest episode of Talking Heads. And the big news is that we're now a podcast. So if you don't want to look at us, then you can listen to us or if it's a bit more convenient that way, um, so be it. So giving you options. Anyway, in this episode, we're gonna be talking about this. It's the 2020 Honda Africa Twin Adventure Sports. And we've had it as a long-term bike for the last 10, 11 months. It's been split between Steve Rose, Luke Brackenbury and I. So we're gonna talk about the good bits the not so good bits and everything you need to know. Gents, cool. Thanks so much for coming along. Um, didn't take you long, Steve, did it? Just to move to your sofa. Uh, so the, He made me come along. <laughs> yeah, forced into it. So the 2020 model, main updates well, there's a lot of updates. I think this, it, it, while it looks fairly similar to the outgoing bike, uh, you know, more tech, more engine capacity, so therefore more performance, lighter weight. It's got the six axis IMU. It's got a new computer system. It's got the twin screen. There's a lot going on with this. Did you think that the old version needed the upgrades? You know, it's a flagship model for Honda. They've got to keep, keep it updated, keep it out there. You know, when, with Euro 5 and you've got to update a bike, it's a good opportunity to to go for it front to back and was it 2016 it was the Africa Twin was re brand was relaunched so they've got a lot of 87,000 models sold or something before popular this year exactly so they've got a lot of customer feedback so they can start going yeah okay we probably could put a lower seat height and actually a detachable subframe would stop bikes getting written off so easily so I think it was a good chance to to sort of bring in customer feedback plus you know as Honda, they'll, they'll go, right, okay, we can make it better. The thing with making bikes is there's a cutoff point, you know, like they can keep development, development, but someone says, you need to stop by now because we need to put them into production. And as soon as they put that into production, they carry on anyway. It's not like they take a, take a pause so much. Maybe they take the afternoon off, but then yeah, they're already back working on, on the, the next, next one, one exactly because they know where it can go. I, I think the other interesting thing with that is that, you know, if you're Honda, you, th this, was a, this was a new model in 2016 for them. And you know, and they've got a whole lot of customers who bought it and loved it, who are now coming to the end of their finance agreements. And and so I guess you know, from from Honda's point of view, you want them to buy another one. So, but you've got to get them to you want you know, there's got to be something about the new one that makes them want to, you know, part X and get it. And and also there's a there's a lot of stuff happening in motorcycling at the moment. You think of how many bikes we've seen, you know, that that were launched two or three years ago that didn't have a TFT display, for example. And TFT seems to just uh, just now become obligatory. So you know, so a, a bike that was launched even a few years ago looks quite old now because everything else that's come out since has had, you know, all this tech and all this stuff. And you've got you, they're in this sort of technology war, aren't they? Where they've got to keep up. Uh, we take it for granted for sure. I think one of the I think one of the most interesting points was that that they took they, while they increased the capacity, they took horsepower from ninety four to one hundred, which is not a massive increase, but of course it makes a big difference because you can't then a to it. But I believe that Honda kind of went, well, we don't really need to because no one was doing that anyway. Yeah, so there was, a, there was a big wave of people going, right, we're going to A2, lots of, you know, the 1050 Adventure from KTM. You know, how many people bought that as A2? You know, I think it's just, Single you could do that, yeah. but realistically. So they were trying to entice a crowd that wasn't there. In which case, do you think they should have done more than 100 brake horsepower? It's funny, when you look at the, when you look at the dyno curves uh, on the review that we've got from, from Simon earlier in the year, overlaying the, the, the previous model and this model, you can see it looks like it's deliberately flattened off on the outgoing one. But riding it this morning, you know, just on the way here, it just revs out too early. You know, you feel like there's so much more to come from the engine, really. Is it enough? I think riding solo, and I'm not a big guy and with a bit of luggage on, it's fine. But, you know, if I was going, doing the big miles, two up with a lot of luggage on, I want a bit more, a bit more power, 120 would be. Yeah be nice you want more revs as well it's a honda thing that i found with non-sporty bikes i had a cb 1300s years ago for a year and that you know you'd go on an overtake or you'd, you'd be on it and then you'd be like oh it's pulling it's pulling then do, 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 and it hits the rev limit and it did that to me this morning i just drove out this roundabout and it's like putting the brakes on it's like give me another five hundred thousand rpm just over rev but i think the engine's obviously got loads more my potential from it but I guess that's the sweet spot for them they feel it's fuel economy just the, you know, the feeling from the engine itself you know it's it's not over the top it's not intimidating it's friendly it's predictable it's 
yeah, it's a nice, nice engine. It's not an exciting engine though. If I just wanted to just clarify that it's the Africa Twin Adventure Sports with the electronic suspension. So of the three <laughs> levels of Africa Twin, there's the base model, don't know whether I'd call it base model, but there's the base model, which is much lighter and it's much more off-road oriented, isn't it? Then there's the Adventure Sports, then there's the Adventure Sports with the electronic suspension. Each of those three have got manual or DCT gearboxes. So it's six in total? Yeah, yeah. And then there's the plus And pack. then you can get the plus pack, which is a, a host of accessories for like two and a half grand, something like that. Yeah, a little bit less than three. So yeah, so yeah just to clarify, we've, it's the Adventure Sports that we've got with the Lecky suspension and DCT. No. No, ours is the manual. It's ours is the manual one. Manual with the semi-auto. Brilliant. Steve, you've done 100 million thousand bazillion motorway miles in about a week on this. Uh, back in uh, the uh, back in last winter, uh, when everything was a little bit freer, how did you find it on the motorway doing all those motorway miles? So you're doing what 150? You're doing about 300 miles a day, weren't you? Something like that. It's like yeah, my I, my house is conveniently 160 miles from the office, so. Um, yeah, a lot of my, I picked the bike up in February. I think it was it was early February when we got it, and by the time we we were in lockdown, which was sort of six weeks later, I think I'd done about two thousand six hundred miles on it. Um, most of those miles were motorway, and and funny, my experience is almost the opposite to Luke's regarding the engine. I never ran out of revs because I was just I was sitting at motorway speeds, and you know, occasional overtakes, occasional you know, getting a bit giddy down a slip road. Perhaps there's about ten miles of my journey that isn't motorway. So, so for me, I, I love the fact that it had enough mid-range power. It had, it, I could sit there in, you know, in either kind of fourth, fifth or sixth gear and overtake really easily on it. Um, I could average kind of 65, 70 miles an hour, even in the heaviest traffic. And I was also averaging somewhere between 60 and 65 to the gallon once it run in, um, which for me was, you know, I'd, I'd much rather have, I'd much rather be able to average 65 miles an hour and 65 to the gallon than, than have, 150 horsepower I, I i never noticed it you know um, but that's you know that reflects we're very different riders very you know we want kind of different things do different things with it i for me the, the interesting thing about this bike was it's it's a very functional motorcycle and and, and honda probably won't want me won't like to say in that you know i when i think of this bike i think of words like dependable and and comfortable and safe and reassuring all the things that you want when you've got 150 miles to go and it's blowing 60 mile an hour gale and chucking it down and and you just want to get home and, and for me i loved it i love the fact that i get on it in the morning you know at six o'clock in the morning knowing that you know the pretty horrendous weather for three hours and i was still going to enjoy riding it i was still going to get to work with a smile on my face with my hands warm and you know and, and it's something about you know it, it we shouldn't take those things for granted you know if you're if you're riding in 60 mile an hour crosswinds um you know you put a lot of faith in the fact that the aerodynamics will work and and that a 21 inch front wheel is probably gives you more stability than a 17 inch front wheel might give you and and all that kind of stuff that we take for granted but actually you know you love it um so yeah mo mostly motorway miles it loves a strong word steve loves a strong word <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Did you love the Did you love the heated grips? How about that? Anybody who rode the previous one, um, I think when I got when I first got on this bike, my first question was, "Hey, how how do the heated grips work?" Because it's February, and are they any good? Because the previous model, um, you heated grips were an option on that, and you would have been very disappointed if you'd paid money for those heated grips because they were never warm enough. And Honda's excuses why they were never warm enough were never quite convincing enough, um, bearing in mind that KTM, Ducati and BMW managed to make heater grips that work perfectly well. Um, and, and on this bike, they do. On this bike, they're fine. And yeah, I, yeah and they're standard kit on certain models. From love to really enjoy. Uh, we're down tuning already. Mm. <laughs> really liked. Well, you know, averagely happy. Luke, come on, you did a big old journey, didn't you? You had a, a monster journey once, right? Yeah, I've, you know, I've, this by, yeah. Uh, I wanted to do a really long journey to try and find the things I love about it, because I've got a, a lot of like for it. Actually, yeah, it's a good point, because you didn't, did you? It was the first time you got on this, you didn't have a lot of love, right? No, and there's still a lot of things that really irk me about it every time I, I get on it. Like Steve says, that reliable, dependable, you know, it's going to get you there and you're going to be comfortable and it's always going to work and, and the fuel economy is good and it's, you know, it's, it's got that premium feel to it. So there, there is all that, which is not always the kind of thing that fires you up about a motorcycle, but 
it depends what you bought it for. But yeah, so I did just uh, about 515 miles in a day on it back in the summer because I was like, right, I want to, I need a long day in the saddle just to try and really learn this bike. You know, I was doing sort of 100 mile trips or 50 mile trips or come to the office, but I was like, right, let's do it, let's do a big one. And um, yeah, really, like the roads, the, I sort of went up through, through Peterborough, where we are, up through uh, Lincolnshire, Wolds, up to across the Humber Bridge to, to Scarborough, all the nice roads that, then across from Scarborough to uh, across the uh, Yorkshire Moors to uh, Morecambe to go and see uh, McGuinness. And then it was, uh, and those roads, oh, stunning, obviously amazing down there. And then I sort of took the, the kind of boringy motorway M6 slog back to kind of, you know, it was a bit later yeah. that day, but to give it that long bit in the saddle that Steve's done a lot of. So, and in that time, you know, I wasn't comfortable at the end. I got off the bike at one o'clock in the morning and I was not aching. My neck didn't hurt. The wind protection was good. My joints didn't hurt. I was just tired from, you know, obviously concentrating that long. And I had, I had, I had a right laugh on it on those, on those roads. I would have preferred to have been on a lot of other bikes over it. Certainly they're some of the best roads in the country, but you know, I did think, oh, it's a 21-inch front wheel. Do I really want that? And this is before we put the Dunlops on it, Steve. You know, it was... But I wasn't out there to try and break that record. I was just trying to, to get there and have fun. And, and I did have a, a real good time on the bike. But I still never got, like, the real hang of the switch gear. And that's... Mm. You think after all that sort of time, and, and you talk about the heated grips, Steve, but the heated grips is a two-button operation on both sides of the bars, and you've got this big block on the left, and it's it's just not intuitive. And I'm of a generation, you know, I've come up through, you know, all the technology, I'm 40 years old nearly, all the technology we've come up through, you just kind of, we're adaptable and we can learn quite quickly. And I've found that from the minute that we handed over the bike, Steve, from, from you to me, and you left, and I was in that, service station car park for half an hour trying to sync up the phone and uh, um, my Bluetooth audio and to get the car play working. I was there for ages. I'm thinking, why can't I do this? You know, and, and I could, in the end I quit, but halfway on the journey back, it kicked into life itself. And I was like, okay, so when that sort of stuff works, it's beautiful, but it's just not intuitive. And we did that test earlier in the year with, with uh, Cy Hargreaves and yeah. within Half a mile on the on the Triumph, you like uh, on the Tiger. That's how it should be done. That's one button, one dial on the on the left switch that you toggle up, down, backwards, and forwards. And there's just things like that that just get on my nerves. Even riding it today, where the indicator is, it's just not where. 25 years of riding motorbikes, the indicator switch is not where you just expect it to be. So or, or the horn. So in those frantic moments where someone's annoyed you, you're like oh, I'm stabbing at the indicate at them. Yeah, I'm gonna put it onto off-road mode, and it's. It's just almost like they didn't work together, the development people or people who rode motorbikes towards the end to go, right, we've got all this amazing technology. And when that car plays work, and I love it with my phone, you can send your ETA, you know, through the, the left switch, like, you know, running a bit late or when I was going to McGuinness, right, this is when I'm going there, so make sure you're at your house and, and just your audio tracks. And that, when that's all working, it's beautiful. And if it's not all working, you've got the bum basic LCD display there. But well, playing devil's advocate, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I've got Honda branding on here, but if you were a customer, if you were going to buy a, this bike and it would take you a day, half an hour, a week, whatever it took to get used to it, do you think that's... that's I've spoke to people who are over there and they just go, I'll just leave it in that, I'll leave it in that mode. So regardless of the fact, all the amazing things it can do and how you can spec it up, they go, I'll just, I'll just leave it like that. Yeah. Maybe they're a little bit fearful of trying it or they just think, well, that feels right for me. And there's no... There's no knock in that. Mm. You know, I spoke, I spoke just this last weekend, a um, guy who's got the previous model, and I was sort of, we were talking about this, and he's like, you don't need all that stuff. It, it was a bit like, you know, he, he was always, the, he also, you don't need ABS. I'm like, ah, come on, we're not having that chat. Everyone needs ABS. Yeah. He's like, well, okay, yeah, it's used it once. I said, he said, but I don't feel like I need to upgrade to the 1100. I don't want that level of technology. And I suppose there are, you know, I think it's, Honda put this as the average age of, 44? 44. Yeah, for buying this. And it's, I don't know, the tech's there, but it just, I'm just still, after all this time, it's not intuitive for me to use. I've got my standard set in now. I've got it plugged in. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much in how I've got the touring mode set up for me, and I'm fine. I like the way it displays there and the power mode and that. But I don't know, just the lack of, like, you know, on that long road, I was on the motorway back and the switch gear's not backlit. I'm still trying to look at it because I still... I'm not, it's just not natural to use it. 
and like I say, you jump on something like a Tiger 900 or a KTM, and you, you've got it straight away. You've got all that technology. You've got the, the menu function, and you just, yeah. oh, that's easy. So I want to explore it because it's easy, not going, oh, I'm a bit fearful of this. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. Steve, there's 16 buttons on that, across that dash. When you first jumped on it, were you in the same sort of situation as Luke? Did it take you a while to get used to it? It was worse for me because it was, it was winter and so it was dark. And so, so my first journey, because the, you know, the one issue I have really with, with that left-hand switch cluster in particular is there are so many buttons on it and, and they're not lit. So, so you're riding home and, and you've got all this new stuff that you want to play with. Um, and you can't work out what any of it does. Uh, and, and, and like you said, I, I did spend some time in the garage and I did sort of have a, have a go through it with the manual and try and work out. But the reality is for, for me, I, I, again, this is a reflection of the kind of rider I am. I'm not interested in that stuff. I, I need to know how to make the heater grips work. I need to know how to switch between the displays that tell me, you know, what my range is and what my trip's saying. But I, I'm kind of, I, I, I want ABS to be there I don't want to have to program it. I don't want to have to decide what level of ABS I want because I'm not going to take it off-road. Um, you know, likewise with traction control. I want traction control to work. I don't want to have... It, I don't want it to be my decision how much traction control I have. But that's me. And, and, and I think what, what Honda have obviously done is they've looked at the competition and they've said the competition are all selling large numbers of bikes and they have all these functions on it. We now have the Bosch IMU. We now have the capability to do all this stuff. Um, so, so let's put it on there. And I guess those people who want it can use it and will learn how to use it and love it. Those people who don't just end up with a massive carbuncle of a left-hand switch gear that they can't operate, but it doesn't really matter. You kind of get used to it. And it's frustrating in a way because I, I, th I think the interesting thing for me is that gold wings aside, Honda have traditionally not they, they've not been as bothered about technologies as other companies honda's you know honda's philosophy has always been about engineering and let's make the bike work and, and they don't try and plaster things in electronics and 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 this is a, got again goldwing aside this is probably the first bike they've built where they've put all this technology on it and, and i think somewhere in the in in the rush to get it on there they haven't spent as much time on the user experience and the functionality and the switch gear as they as they maybe could have done and and you know the next generation will be better in the same way as you know the latest generations of bmws ktms and ducatis um are just and triumphs and just much more intuitive because they're on version three or version four and it, 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 the honda the honda switch gear to me i got used to it and, I, and in the end i worked out how to use it but it's not the best switch gear that's out there. And, and, and bizarrely, I think it's, it's at odds with the rest of the bike. I, I, what we were saying earlier on about, uh, about the Honda being dependable and reliable and well-built and all that kind of stuff that isn't sexy and doesn't sell bikes. If I was buying an adventure bike because I was planning a six-month trip into the wilderness, I'd much rather have something that's going to be dependable and reassuring than, than something that's got all the latest high-tech that's going to break by the time I get to Tunisia. And, and and so so for me it's sort of odds you know Honda have built this thing which is 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 genuinely you feel like it's never going to break it's never going to let you down, and then they've stuck up this great Amstrad Hi-Fi on the left hand handlebar, um, that just uh, yeah, that just worries me. Yeah, I'd love to know how many sort of eleven hundred owners just go. Do you know what? I'm all right with that. I've got my that's my setting yeah. and I'm good and I know how to turn the heated grips on. I don't know, we need to sort of do a, a, a it be interesting what comments we get to this, but yeah, I think some people just aren't bothered, but there is a bragging rights, isn't it, to say, yeah, it can do all that. And with the, you know, the six axis IMU, you know, you, you've got all that functionality, so why not add it? And you can, like you say, you can ignore it, can't you? You know, it, the system defaults in a nice, safe way, traction on, ABS on, away you go. Hey, it's got all those rider modes, so there's all those standard stuff, and then you can and then you can work on your own setting too. I guess that's part and parcel. If you're the owner, you want to you want to kind of pre-program that before you buy it. You don't want to have to pay for stuff that you're not using. You right? do a questionnaire during the buying process, yeah. and, and actually by the time you get there, you've got they've dialed it in for you. We've already spoken about this on a different video about the amount of accessories and the amount of time it takes to buy a, a new bike or a new car these days. You could spend hours just going through all the list of options, but it's worth it perhaps if you don't then pay for the stuff that you don't use. Apple Pay. Let's talk about Apple Play. Steve, did you use that? Not at all. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I've, I've just about to reach the point in technology where, where I plug my heater kit into the 12-volt into the socket on the left-hand side and I plug my ancient iPod into the USB socket on the right-hand side to charge it 
and I, and I you and I've got a Bluetooth helmet, and so I powered. I used my iPod and my Bluetooth helmet rather than than using the Apple Play on the bike. And I apologise to Honda and their their massive development team for that. Um, I just it was simple, and when it's five o'clock and you just want to get home, I did that rather than learn how to use it. I mean, I love it when it's working. I mean, I'm a big fan of that sort of stuff. I've just retrofitted uh, a CarPlay system to my to my van. And it's just, yeah, I love my iPhone. So having that when it's all working, the kind of holy trinity with the, the Bluetooth headset uh, and the dash, it's amazing with, you know, you, you know, how you can use the map functionality, just you know, the calls and obviously your playlist. And it really does, you know, when, I, when it did kick in, it was really, it's been really intermittent for me when it wants to work. And I don't know if that's, you know, I use genuine uh, Apple connection, you know, a cable, whether it's shaking at all or whatever. But on that 515 mile trip, I think I had the CarPlay working for half that time. But when it did work, it was a thing of beauty. You know, I was trying to rely on the, on the map. So I had my phone on a, on a separate mount on the bars and it was mainly trying to use the, the CarPlay for my, for my route because I didn't know where I was going. I'd already planned it. But when that wasn't working, then obviously it was back on the phone, which is not quite the same what you want to be looking at. But it's, you know, I love that sort of technology. I really do. And, and when it is easy and intuitive, it's a joy for me. It, it adds to that, you know. It's we, um, we talked earlier about, Steve, you mentioned Ducati and KTM and BMW uh, as its kind of closest rivals. Do you reckon there's that kind of cachet around, around the Honda that, that, that takes it to that kind of level, a Multistrada or a GS? I think so. I think the, the GS is a separate entity because it's a, you know, it, it's a whole subsection of motorcycling on its own. If I were going to buy a bike like this, I would, I would buy the, I'd buy the Honda before I bought KTM and or the Ducati, just because, because the things I like about it, the things I want this bike to do, which as I said before, are more about function than flash. Um, I, I think this does well. I, I've ridden, I, I've done a lot of miles on a KTM 1290 Adventure. Um, I've done a le less miles on a Multistrada and they've, they've all got things that make you smile. They've all got things that, as, as test bikes, they're great. You have them for a few weeks and hand them back. The things that appeal to me about those bikes aren't the things that would make me pay my own money for a bike. And I liked, I really enjoyed the fact that the Honda has that kind of reassurance. Um, I, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to say, but you know, my experience of, Ducatis have been much better recently. My experience of KTMs has, has recently been ruined by small niggles that I've never had big problems with, I've never had big faults, but I've also, you know, I've had kind of niggles with them that make me think, if I were gonna go on that six month big life-changing adventure, um, I'd, I'd trust that I was gonna come back um, more readily and with less hassle on a Honda. <laughs> And that sounds like a cliche. I I know that, and I'm very aware that that one of the people in this conversation um, has you know has a, long, a deeper history with KTM than the rest of us. That's kind of how I feel about it. And I think if you're going to buy one of these adventure bikes, if that's the fantasy that you're going to go off and and do that big trip, then then for me that that feeling of just kind of dependability makes massive difference. So we reckon that that stands at about seventeen grand, don't we? That that we've got here. With what we've got well, on it. With what we've got on it. We've got the centre stand and we've, uh, and there's a couple of other bits on it. But if you, so theoretically or hypothetically, if you had £17,000, where's your money going? If I'm honest, if I had £17,000 and it was on a venture bike, I'd buy a GS because I've, because I, I, for what I want as a road bike, um, the GS does, does what I want it to do better. Uh, and it's got more character and more personality. Um, and I, you know, I'm a long-term fan of GSs. The the one thing, the one thing the GS doesn't do um, that this Honda does very, very, very well is when you open the garage door in the morning and you look at a GS, you kind of think it's still a bit ugly. Um, when you look at when you open the garage door and look at the Africa Twin in those colours in particular, it is it's just such a beautiful motorcycle. Every time you see it, every time it catches your eye, you look at it and just think it's just gorgeous. And, and, you know, as sad and, you know, as that sounds, it's quite an important part of it, isn't it? You know, if you open your garage in the morning and look at that, you, you feel like a better person. Looks are very subjective, though, and I have sort of put that into, into my feeling about it. I think it is a, as adventure bikes go, it's a, it's a handsome machine and, and probably why they've not, you know, really changed it between the previous models. I guess the feedback was that, you know, yeah, it looks all right because the yeah, GS is 
pig ugly, you know. My two doors up neighbour, he, he's, he's a GS owner and he's, he's been really sort of looking at this Africa Twin. He's come over a few times, oh, I need to have us try on one of those, you know. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, you've, he's a guy who's gone from a tracer to a GS and now he's, he's reached the, how's it, the epitome of adventure bikes. Now he's going, oh, this Africa Twin looks quite He's got to a certain age, that's what you say. Well, he's younger than me. <laughs> no, he's younger than me and um, not that I'm old. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess it is yeah, a far better looking bike. But getting back to what you said a minute ago, you know, about you, the big trips. And, and one of the other plus points for me was, is this badge, you know, Honda and particularly then Africa Twin? Because think about dealerships, you know, the spread of dealerships, you know, OK, not just UK, but Europe. There's Honda dealerships, you know, everywhere. You know, and if you are going to some of the smaller brands like GK or KTM, you, you know, you're not going to find as many dealers in a, you're going to have to really travel for that, you know, it's that sort of thing in the mind of you, you when it comes to servicing and purchasing and any sort of issues of warranty. But Africa Twin, you know what you're getting with the bike as well. You know what it stands for, you know, it's sort of heritage. And I don't know how many people are taking this uh, adventure sports version off road, but I suppose that's why they've been a lot more clearer on the two different models. Mm. Sub models from the six this year, what you're getting. So, yeah, would I buy this for 17 grand? I think yeah. we spent that time on the Tiger 900 this yep. year, yep. and I really enjoyed that. It's not the same prestige, the same look, but it, I had a lot of fun on it. I could use it easily. It was. Would you want to take that off road or the Tiger? To be honest, no, none of them really. Anyway, yeah. like a, maybe like a fire road or gravel road mm -hmm. for a bit of bragging rights and some for the Instagram. But, <laughs> but really, you know, if you want to go off road, buy an off road bike. Yeah. You know, geez, yeah. this. I still don't get the off road thing on the. I, for me, the, these these bikes are bikes that you they're they're road bikes that you accept that in certain parts of your big adventure you'll be riding on roads that are are less than ideal and maybe potholed and maybe a bit rough. But that's a big difference between that. An off-road, I say, if, if you, an off-road bike for me, and I'm not an off-road rider, but an off-road bike for me is, is 130 kilograms and 40 horsepower. And, you know, it's a CRF 250 like you've, like you've just bought. That, that's an off-road bike. To me, taking something that weighs twice as much as a CRF 250 off-road is a bit like taking a gold wing on a track day. You know, it's, you're, you're taking something which is it's, it's twice as big and twice as heavy as the things that normally inhabit that environment. And, and why would you do it? I, but I get it entirely. That, and we, we haven't talked about suspension yet in all of this. And, and, and one of the things, you know, for those kind of environments, for that kind of, you know, when, when you hit, you know, a European country where the roads aren't as good as, as you know, like Britain, for example, where the roads are terrible. And, and suddenly you're, you're in, the, you know, you've come from that lovely tarmac in France into, back into Britain and all the potholes and all the crap. And, all, and you love the fact that you've got, you know, you've got proper long... Long travel suspension and... Lots of good damping. Yeah, spoked wheels. <laughs> and, 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 you know, for someone who's not, you know, I, 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 I blow hot and cold with technology, but I've, the, the latest generation of the, of the electronic suspension... Um, on all on all models, to be fair, I think all manufacturers have, have got this so right now. But but on on the Africa Twin in particular, the electronic suspension that's on there, it's just lovely. It, it's just you just don't notice it. it. It does what it does, and it sorts out everything that's going on underneath you, and you just enjoy the ride, and you never even think about it. You you know you can ride on some pretty pretty nasty rural back roads, and it just does it. And and you're there on a two hundred and forty kilogram bike with big handlebars sat six feet off the ground and and it just does everything you expect it to do steve have you been the, the non-semi-active version of this bike no yeah we the one we had on test earlier that was conventional and that was fine i never thought well oh, that's not as under damped or it's too soft you know it's yeah when you 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 get onto a bike of that size and you approach those type of corners in, in that particular mindset you know you're on a big heavy thing that shouldn't necessarily you know you shouldn't be getting your knee down but for a 21-inch wheeled adventure bike, it handles really, really well, surprisingly well, I think. Did I notice too much difference between the suspension? Perhaps I've not tested it enough with pillion, with luggage, to make to notice that much of a difference, certainly when switching between the, the modes that you can. I don't know, how did you find it on your... The manual suspension was, was fine in the fens, you know. Again, we weren't carrying big loads luggage or pillion, so it was fine, so I'm not heavy. And, yeah, it, it did work nicely, but I, I don't know, just... Does it need that 21 inch? I'd like a 1917 sort of combination on that. It works 
works well. It's, I suppose it is for the looks. It's what it's all about in the heritage. And we just talked about how many people will take it off road and it can do it. And I've seen plenty of videos and I know people have taken it. As soon as I picked it up from you, Steve, I went, oh, I'm gonna go on some of the green lanes near mine and, and managed to get it in some ruts right up to the exhaust guard there. And I just went, didn't really feel right standing up on this thing. I'm knees hitting this big old tank now. I was like, don't think I'm gonna be doing a lot of off road riding yeah. on this. It's not, you know, it, like you say, if, I was on my own and I got it pretty stuck and it was like, yeah, what am I doing? This is not, it's not what it's for really. This is a 25 litre, near, near enough a 25 litre yeah. tank, isn't it? So it's a, so it's, it's much more of a tourer than an off-roader, which is why the, the, the base model is the 18 litre tank. But that said, you know, I took the old version to that Dave Thorpe school and, and I was good, yeah. astounded, not astounded, I was impressed by what it could do. Yeah. What it could do, not what I could do, because there's no chance of me doing that. But I guess it's horses for courses, isn't it? it? It can do so many different things. It has got so many different options. It's all about tailoring it to your, but, but then so are so many different bikes on the market now. You can, you can do the same, you know, you, yeah. there's almost too many options. But in terms of um, just kind of taking it back to comfort, overall comfort, the seat technically is, is slightly lower, slightly slimmer. Uh, the, the screen is uh, adjustable. Uh. Um, I know it's been a bit of a bugbear of yours. <laughs> While you sit and stew on that, <laughs> let's talk to Steve about about. Look, you, you've you've done. We know you've already done lots and lots of miles on the on the road. But in terms of comfort, in terms of um, wind protection, uh, weather protection, uh, you kind of rode it in the the worst kind of conditions that that Britain can offer. Yeah. Uh, how was it for you? It was really good. It's better than I expected because again, yeah, it, it's it's a narrower seat than than before, and you know and. and a lot of kind of adventure bikes don't have, you know, if they go if they're going for that kind of genuine off road look, they'll sacrifice sometimes a bit of comfort. But it was really comfy. They, it's, it, it's, the whole riding position for me was just right. It, it's it's a really nice relationship between where the handlebars are, where your feet are, and the seat, and and the kind of weight distribution, and and the kind of wind pressure that comes off the screen. I never had a problem with comfort. The whole. I, 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 I did a lot of 160 mile journeys. I never did a journey. I don't think I've done a journey on it that's longer than 160 miles. Um, but it's in, in the kind of traffic I'm riding in, it's typically, you know, two and a half, maybe three hours on a bad day. Um, and I just kind of sit there and, and just, you know, just always absolutely fine. No back aches, no bum aches, you know, no wrist aches. No, it, it's, it's, you know, two things I would say with it. I think the, the seat may be 50 millimetres lower than certainly the Adventure Sport model last year. Um, it's still a very tall seat and, and the bike leans over a long way on a centre stand. So it's sort of, it makes it easier to get your leg over it. But having got your, your right leg over it, um, it's still quite a heave to get it off the centre stand then because it's leant so far over. Um, right. And particularly when you've got, you know, your thermals and your Windsor kit and your, you know, all that. It's, you know, when you're padded up like a snowman, it's... You know, it just getting on the thing take is is a bit of a knack. It takes you a while to get used to it. Um, I'll talk about the screen before Luke does because I know Luke's got opinions on the screen. I found it, because because of the seat high, I had the seat in the lowest position, and then I had the screen on the lowest position too. Um, and what I found was in, in daylight, I'm six foot, and in daylight where you're where you're looking a long way into the distance because you can see into the distance. I, I'm, I was just looking over the top of the screen and I didn't find it a problem. But as soon as it got, to, as soon as it got dark and, and you can't see into the distance anymore, it, you, your eyes naturally drop back and you sort of you look to where the edge, edge of your headlights are. And, and that meant looking through the screen rather than looking over it. And, and with the seat in the lowest position um, and even the screen in the lowest position, I couldn't see over the screen. I, I had to look through the screen to look at where my headlights were. And, and in the middle of winter, that screen, by the time I get anywhere near home, that screen is usually filthy and covered in, you know. And, and so the last sort of 20, 30 miles when it got dark and, and the screen was dirty, um, I found myself kind of looking round, riding by having to look round the edge of the screen, which is a shame because the headlights are actually really good. The headlights are powerful and it's got cornering headlights. Another benefit of having the, you know, the six axis IMU is that it's now got cornering headlights. Headlights are great. Um, but you know you'd never see it they don't throw light as far as daylight uh, and that was the time I had a problem the last 20 miles every journey I find myself kind of riding like that I'm trying to see around it and I'm the same with the, with the screen it's having to look around it you know particularly nighttime riding you know the, like you say the calling lights are great really good but you can't it's particularly night you can't you have to sort of like really over the top get around it and 
Um, also in the rain, you must have had some rain journeys, it's the, the sort of profile of it doesn't seem to shift the water, so it just kind of sits on there and sticks it to it. But, you know, you're, I'm five foot eight, you're six foot. So for me, the seat on the lowest position, I'm the most comfortable when I come to a stop. You know, I try not to stop so much, but, if you, you know, take my kids on the back of the Africa Twin, you want to have that kind of flat-footed uh, assurance. But if I had the seat on the lowest and the screen on the lowest, again, I was up and over and trying to not look through it. So I'd have to put the seat on the highest position with the screen lower to kind of be the, for the optimum for me. It still wasn't perfect. But that sort of aside, and obviously, you know, it's difficult to make something that was going to fit everyone. You know, they've brought the seat height lower, which is a great thing. And you said, you know, about when you're all togged up, I'm all winter togged up today. So it is quite hard cocking your leg over and you got these big baggy pants on. Glad he said pants. Baggy pants, MC Hammer, you know, textiles on to sort of, yeah, flick it off the world's most leaning over side stand ever. It's a bit of a palaver. But nothing bothers me about the screen. It's again, you know, you all know this, Steve, from your day. Suzuki's GSX 1100F had an electronic adjustable screen a billion years ago, right? Why is this thing with its touchscreen dash? It's got a screen system that you have to use two hands with. It's all right if you go, all right, you know, it's really chucking down. And I agree with you, the weather protection on the bike is, is great, but if you want a bit more, because it's really chucking down, you either put it on cruise control and then take your hands off the bars and lift it up, or go, I'm going to pull over now and adjust my screen. I just, I can't see how that happens when there's so many other manufacturers that have come up with a solution to do that, either mechanically, barbarically, one-handed, pulling it up, shoving it up, or dial adjusters. I'm, again... It's yeah. solid and neat, I guess, and weight saving, but oh, it's a bit annoying. I think that the standard Africa Twin actually has a shorter screen as well, doesn't it? So, so there is a shorter screen available. There's a higher screen available. All right. I'd like an inch taken off. Angle grinding. Junior Hacksaw will be fine. But you were talking about comfort. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on the comfort thing, just before we gloss over that. You know, the seat, I did that 515 mile, all comfortable. Just the bars, the bars just that little bit too wide set for me. The, the, the throw's nice, and obviously you can rock them backwards and forwards to adjust them. And the height's great, but it's just a bit, bit wide. And, and you know, from, from getting it out of my gate in the morning, I have to open both sides of that, which I always forget. I'm like, oh, crap. And, you know, you can see it on my CCTV. You can hit the wood with the pegs. Oh, I've got to stop and open both gates to get it through. And even this morning, coming to the office, filtering through traffic, you're like, oh, I can't do that. I really can't do that. It's just too much. You know, I'd, I'd love to com kind of compare it to everything else, but it feels a lot wider. It looks a lot wider. And it is the difference between stationary traffic going, oh, I'm just going to have to sit behind this, which is not reasons why I ride motorbikes, mm. to sit behind cars. It's, to it's funny because I didn't have a problem with that. I, again, I, you know, part, well, a lot of my journey probably is, is M25 and, and M11 and A14. And... And the bits of the M25 that are usually really busy are very busy. And, and at the time I'm on there, it tends to be trucks rather than cars. So, so I was, I, 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 last winter, I got very um, analytical, let's say, about what can filter and what can't. And I got, I, I got obsessed with the height of mirrors and how that relates to a Ford Transit mirror or, a, you know, whatever. And, and, and it got to the point where as, you, as you're processing a line of traffic, you can see, yeah, that's a VW van. I know I'm going to hit that mirror. I'm going to do that. And, and you just get ridiculously kind of scientific about it. And I didn't have a problem with it at all. There, there were lots of bikes I did have a problem with. Um, I didn't have any issue. I, I found that the mirrors on that were higher than your average car mirror, um, but not quite as high as a typical van mirror. And I didn't really have a problem with the bars. Um, maybe it's because it's motorways rather than than kind of you know inner city roads but i found it great for and, and i was really 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 pleased that we hadn't got a bike with panniers on it because panniers would have <laughs> would have had quite a big impact on that i think they're quite wide panniers and the top case that we've got for ours you know is is nice it's solid it's locks great on it it's, it's gone from your when you handed over from me from the the winter to the sort of uh, spring months you know it corroded a little bit which uh, it lost its sort of finish on that, so I guess that needs a good, good sort of uh, smattering of ACF 50 on it or something like that. But talk sort of talking about crow. I mean, it's it's held up. You you rode it through the the crap of times, and that you can. There's no sign of that on there, apart from that's the only thing on those on those box mm. on that top box. It just shows like salt's got to it really, but everything else, the finish on it's stunning really. 
I don't know what that white frame's going to look like over, over time, but it's, you know, it's well protected with guards and that on it. Maybe it's because it had a white frame, but I, would, I cleaned it more in winter than I... That, you know, normally when I'm doing those kind of journeys, because you get home and you, you feel you're so knackered when you get home, you often, you know, you don't want to then spend 20 minutes, half an hour cleaning it. But I did clean it probably every week that I had it, um, partly because I was, I was curious to see where, you know, what was going to happen in the nooks and crannies of that frame and just, you know, just see, I, I, was there going to be anywhere that started, you know, caught a bit of corrosion, but I didn't see any. It's not an easy bike to clean though. You need all the brushes and that. There's a lot of nooks and crannies to get in and, but it's, 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 it's held up well though, would you, which is what you kind of you'd expect though. Honda build quality, yeah. absolutely. I think it's, it's well put together, it looks great. I want to mention a couple of things that we haven't spoken about so far, or certainly highlights and lowlights for me. TFT screen, six and a half inch screen is, is lovely and pretty and it looks great, but oh, God, doesn't it take an age to, when, you, when you turn the ignition on? You sit there. Oh yeah, it does That's take a while and then it wants you to go through the warnings screen to press, to yeah, okay, it, yes. Yeah. That's annoying. It's not exactly a bike for a quick getaway. But that's that screen going up. The, you know, the little LCD one at the bottom's already yeah. doing its thing. I do like the fact, though, that, that, that they have it, the, the difference in the corporate culture, that when you turn on a KTM, it comes up with a screen that says, we're ready to race. And, and when you turn on the Honda, it basically comes up with a message from your mum that says, motorbikes are a bit dangerous. Are you OK with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I want to highlight the, the talk of the engine as well, because I thought that that was a really positive point. I like the, the fact that it's got a good spread. I think it's, it's not, it sounds good. Do you like a good spread? I do like a good spread, yeah, especially when it's nice and easy. Um, from from low down to in the mid range to the top, I know you said you, you know, like the sort of the revving out part, but I think performance wise for a bike of that size, that's what um, I like about it. If I want an adventure bike, I want I want a bit of grunt and a bit of power, and I think that it actually def almost defies a hundred brake horsepower. It, it feels like it's got a bit more. Yeah, think about the seven ninety adventure engine though, compared to that, you know, it's carrying around a lot more in terms of bulk. And, and, and presence was something else I wanted to the talk about as well. The 900 Triumphs engine. Yeah, very good. Very, very good. Yeah, yeah. I'm not comparing it. I'm just saying that I like this engine. It's a nice engine. It, yeah, yeah. It's your opinion. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice engine. I do like the Triumph, for sure. I like the trip. I like the character that it's got. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's got that, that probably that, that bit more energy. Mm -hmm. And it just gives you a bit more, as a rider, it gives you a bit more of a feel. It's a very sportier bike compared to this. But. but I like the torque that it has and I like the presence on, on the road. I like the fact that it's, I, I, I get your point about the, the, the width of the handlebars. In, it's, it, from a practical perspective, it's a bit of a pain. But I like the fact that you sit there and you, you, are, you are boss of the road because it's got a big presence. Yeah, it's got definitely a commanding presence about it. And you know, even things like the, the, the daytime running lights on those lights, you've got the sort of American style where the indicators are kind of lit mm. all the time. So you, know, you notice that bike yeah. in mirrors. It, yeah. you, know, you do feel like people are going to see me on the road. It's got, yeah, it's got that feel about it. So that was my final two points. I think we've, we've talked quite a lot about this. Uh, is there anything particular, Steve, that you want to talk about uh, that we perhaps we've missed? I like the fact that Honda offer an alternative. I, I like the fact that, that in a world where everything now has to have the kind of horsepower that a sports bike would have had 10 years ago, that Honda have been bold enough to say, actually, let's just build something which is really easy to use, which is probably in a very low state of tune, um, and therefore, we, you know, will be dependable and, and, you know, and will do those mileages that we all hope they will do. Uh, but, you know, uh, but again, it, it's, it's that focus on probably on economy as much as anything. And, and my most exciting moment on, on that bike was, was the, the night when I got home at an average speed of 65 miles an hour and 65 miles to the gallon. And 65 miles an hour never sounds like a lot when you're talking about an average speed. But when you consider that that journey I was doing at that time had 20 miles of 40 mile an hour roadworks at one end of it, another 20 miles of 40 mile an hour roadworks at the other end of it. And, you know, an averaging, just averaging 70 miles an hour on most bikes is, is you know, is pretty challenging. I was, I was thrilled when I got home that night. It was the most, <laughs> the, the most excitement I had for a long while, which probably says more about me than anything else. I've, ju I've just found my stats from that 513.3 mile day. It was an average consumption of 47.2 miles to the gallon, an average speed of 58 mile per hour. And so that was all right. Doing well. Yeah. I think you'd be proud of that. And you don't need to go and see the osteopath after, no, you know, had you've done it on an R1. No, I didn't. Um, my bugbears for me, yeah. we talked about the side stand, it leans over too far. 
center stand should be standard when you've got chain drive and, and actually you can't put it on a paddock stand can you because of the big chain fin on there so really without the center stand ch your chain maintenance mm. is, is quite difficult but you know we've got all the bells and whistles but where's the quick shifter where's your quick shifter oh, there's, there's nice i'm not bothered about things like keyless but when you think about what else is out there just quick shifter would be nice and I, again speaking to different owners and of the current bike and the old bike they're like nah i'm not bothered by that when this Test bike arrived. Was that I was hoping we were going to get a DCT version. I, I'm a big fan of DCT. I, and again, for for the kind of miles I do and the kind of riding I do, um, yeah, I, I would like DCT. I think that the the one thing the kind of the, the one my kind of conclusion from it, um, and and again, this is probably something I, I don't know. If this is the right thing or the wrong thing to say, really. But for all those miles I did on it, and for all the time I spent on it, and all the stuff I've talked about that I loved about it. The actual reality for me, when I sit and be and sit down and honestly and think about it, is probably I would have got all those things that I've enjoyed from the Africa Twin, apart from the styling and apart from that feeling when you open the garage door. Um, I would have got pretty much all of that had I been riding an NC seven hundred and fifty, and and I think I think that that's the point for me. I think if you're if you're going to do the big adventure and you're going to do a lot of riding two up, uh, and this is you know this is the bike that's going to have that big life moment for you then I think the Africa Twin is, is, is the one you want. I think if you're like me, if you're wanting something that is a, is a functional motorcycle that will just do that thing and make, make every journey enjoyable and make, every journey, make you a winner out of every journey and be cheap to run and dependable and all the stuff that I talked about, actually you can buy an NC750, which is probably about half the price, um, and then spend the rest of your money on a CBR650 to go and have fun on the weekend. I think you can you could buy this, and we talked about VFR 800s before we started the call. You know, obviously because of the project bike. I think this would be a bike like that. You know, you could have this for 20 years. It still look great. It will still ride great. You know, maybe semi-active. I don't know. Maybe you go for the manual ones just so you know what you're doing with that. God knows how that's going to be in 20 years time. But you'd still feel great being on there. You'd have a smashing ride every time you went on it. So maybe as a kind of whereas everything else seems a bit kind of fashion. It's probably its rivals, maybe not the GS so much. If you had this and you kept it and you looked after it and it would, it would, you know, it would age well. You'd be still chuffed 15, 20 years opening the, the garage door, doing that big, big mission every summer, that big trip. I'm sure in 20 years time, we'll all be on hydrogen powered hover bikes or something like that anyway. <laughs> we'll, well, uh, well, we'll get together in 20 years time. We'll, <laughs> we'll ride this. Good, right. We'll wrap it up. Thank you, Luke, for your input uh, and expertise. Thanks, Steve, for yours too. Uh, enlightening stuff. I'm sure there are many opinions and comments to be had, so uh, feel free, if you're watching on the video, to put them on below. Uh, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, then yeah, again, feel free to, to email us, inquiries at bikesocial.co.uk. So um, for those who are watching video, you've got a Bennett's Rewards advert coming up uh, just now. And for those who are listening on the podcast, then you've got the opportunity to listen to Luke to talk about Bennett's rewards. Mega, thanks guys, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and see you next time. when we finish this, just because I'm aware of both of your. But if you are coming from, <coughs> choking on my own spit, <coughs> a quick shifter would be nice. Come on, quick shifter, you can put that on there, be nice. It's EMU, you can, IMU. IMU. EMU. Not EMU. <laughs> That'd be interesting.